that process of stabilizing an objective view, as work in science and technology studies clearly show, is constructive work. It requires us to agree our methods, have certain shared presuppositions. It requires a great deal of communion or, or shared ground between us before objectification can work. And then um, a simplistic discourse then presumes that objects are facts, are things, are indisputable, they're just there. And everything else is a pure mystery, so the word subject becomes pure mystery. And the world, as we said, could be taken to mean almost anything in any discourse. In fact, in many respects, the world has taken the place of both nature and God in, in discourse. People try to rein in their cosmological ambitions, so they assume that when I speak of the world, you know what I mean. But if I speak of the world, I mean everything, really. And any attempt to refer to everything fails. Often when we think about cognitive agents, we tend to draw a pretty strict division between subject and world. Fred Cummings' work is dedicated to exploring the thesis that you can't plausibly draw a distinction between mind and life. Fred Cummings is a cognitive scientist at UC Dublin who is working in the inactive Fourier approaches, although what that exactly means gets a little bit muddied as this conversation progresses. Uh, he has always also developed the topic of joint speech. So joint speech is when two or more people say the same thing at the same time. Uh, pragmatic examples of joint speech are prayer, sports, uh, protest, and education. Here is my conversation with Fred Cummins. We were, we were just noting the difficulty of uh, getting what seemed to be quite important insights from 4E and similar embodied approaches, especially in action, um, into a popular discourse. But the popular discourse is so terribly, terribly polluted and conducted in so many registers and in such an uninformed manner that I find the only discourse I can contribute to is one in which uh, I can come from a position of an embodied cognitive scientist, whatever that means. And what that means is a big puzzle to me. Um, and that means taking distance from, that is, refusing to get engaged in arguments that rely on the construction of an internal mind or cognitive system, the psychological subject, which exists as cognition between perception and action, always between. I don't know if you know Susan Hurdy's work. Susan Hurdy parodied the cognitive sandwich. You got a slice of bread is perception in, slice of bread is action out, and then inside is a spook. And we thought behaviorism had outlawed the spooks. You know, we let one right back in. Um, so... The trouble is that this model is the language with which we talk about ourselves in everyday discourse. And we make frequent references to our brain and to psychological processes, which while they help us articulate ourselves and make sense of our worlds, they, when understood within a scientific context, they turn out to be constructions, constructions, um, not discoveries. So. For example, things like attention and memory are, first of all, meaningless words. Then they become words that describe how we talk about ourselves. And then the psychologist with methods gets in there and starts making them up, making up methods. I mean, the ultimate method here is the IQ test, for example. Right? There's nothing, nothing whatsoever behind it. Um, but you can make tests. And with that, you can bring something into being. You see, by constructive methods, you can bring something into being until it lives as I said, rent-free in our heads, and becomes part of the, the language with which we describe ourselves. So it's, it's got quite difficult in the scientific fields to take on these entrenched views. I, I, I don't think we can ever over, overcome them. I think what we can do is provide thinking fuel to allow people who can engage with these ideas to learn and grow from them. And, and it's, But it's not going to be uh, a straightforward business. You can't just contribute to uh, an ill society with ill forms of discourse by just adding more to that discourse. You know, I think that's why I, I personally got quite careful about what I say and where, although you wouldn't believe it to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just talking to Robert Sternberg, who did a lot of work on IQ and wisdom and, and, and intelligence. And he mentioned the same thing, that it's, it's worse than that, where it's just self-perpetuating is that we have this faulty notion of what IQ is, and then we set up institutions of power and knowledge that try to reflect that. And then you just 
people who enter into it who, have, who are of a certain mold just want to build a world that reflects what they learned as being ideal. Um, and this is, I feel like, throughout, right, like how neuroscience is reported is a, is a big problem. <laughs> yeah. But we, we mentioned IQ tests, and I'd rather not get sidelined into the debate about intelligence, because I think it's, maybe we, you and I can agree on this, and we let the readers make their, or viewers make their own mind up, but intelligence is a bullshit idea invented by Europeans to, to describe how they think of themselves as special. Intelligence is a virtue. It's something you want to be. You want to be more intelligent. You want to be most intelligent. And God's probably most intelligent of all. So it's, they're looking in a mirror and then creating methods to describe what they think they would find there. And we do this all the time. Um, mirror neurons are another good example. Brains are a complete mystery. We're sure we want to find a reflection of ourselves in there. And lo and behold, mirror neurons are constructed. They don't exist. They're constructed. They're constructive things. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with the mirror neuron debate. And, and I'm, I'm happy to be speaking to you rather than to the general public. In the general public, such a discussion would have to begin with the story of how mirror neurons were found in a laboratory. And then we might have to discuss research methods with, with macaque monkeys and and, and and then the ensuing public discourse and the wave of hype. Um, what we would never get to is the obvious fact that mirror neurons simply don't exist, but they can be made to exist. They exist if you originally decide that some parts of the brain belong to perception, some parts of the brain belong to motor, and that you can identify the part that belongs to motor, and now lo and behold, it displays properties you would expect if it was in perception side. Right? You can find those neurons. They're not otherwise distinguished. They're distinguished only by your pre-theoretical uh, framing of the brain in those terms. So we construct things all the time. And, and because of science and method, people get very, uh, you know, they place far too much faith in the assertions of the scientists, which do get brutal. You know, it's a brutal world out there. <laughs> I think one problem is just, the idea that people think that we can reduce down to one or two methods, right? That everything will just boil down to one right way of doing things. And the more you dive down into these things, it just doesn't seem like we'll ever read something like that or, or that we need to. Well, well me methods throw up a great smoke screen. Um, the, a lay view of science, an uninformed view of science, thinks that at the heart of, of science is experiment. Now, usually the experiment in question. There's the Michelson-Morley experiment where you go off and there's going to be an eclipse and you've got a prediction and you've got equations and there's, there's going to be an answer, either yes, and light bends or it doesn't bend. There's a gravitational lens or there's not. And we set out with a good hypothesis and we go and observe the natural world and bang, we get an answer. That is a wonderful experiment. Don't get me wrong. It's one of the most beautiful thing, experiments ever conducted. But it's not what people think of in experiments where you get people into the laboratory, torture them, sit them down, treat them as ridiculous objects, display things at them, ask questionnaires, how connected are they to the universe, and poke them a little bit. And we call that experiments. And, and, and it feeds off the virtue of the beautiful um, relativity experiment. But it's no trouble to design crap experiments. I mean, 99.9% .9 of experiments, at least in the human and behavioral sciences, are just not worth doing. Right, right. And there's also the case that there just are some parts of the world that are regular enough and general enough that they could be reduced down to one framework. And then there are parts of life that aren't. And that needs to be respected and taken seriously. Well, you reference something which is always assumed in our conversations there called the world. It's it's a convenient fiction. I mean, the the, the sense, the the what's what's in, what, what you mean to pick out with that will vary every time you utter those words. They won't always mean a blue ball in space on a particular date. Uh, they might mean the world of medieval jousting. Or <laughs> you know, in the world of medieval jousting, we can probably find methods to you know deal with the phenomena that arise in that world and, and treat them with the respect they deserve. But it would be confined to the world of medieval jousting. Um, the world of the responses of a psychological subject in the cognitive psychologist laboratory, you know, that's a world to the cognitive psychologist laboratory, but it's a world as obviously relevant to cosmology and living as medieval jousting is. <laughs> okay, so maybe maybe we could start there for the audience. Um, that the, the idea of world and subject. You know, 
understanding the mind or cognition, whatever those things are, uh, as divided into these neat categories of world and subject. Um, this has been around with us forever. Um, where's the mistake in thinking about things like that? Right, you went straight for the two most problematic words, world and subject. How'd you pick object, like teapot? We'd be on firmer ground, right? You know what a teapot is, I know what a teapot is, there's a teapot. Turns out, of course, there's a lot to being a teapot. There's a lot more than any representation of a teapot can count or capture. Um, but we're very good at arriving at consensus around objects. We, we come with common bodies and their common conditions to a teapot, and we, 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 we get by, we coordinate just fine with respect to the teapot. Unfortunately, that is, of course, the teapot exists objectively in the sense that we're not going to get into any metaphysical fights about this teapot. There it is. It's a wonderful little teapot. Um, but it leaves that process of stabilizing an objective view, as work in science and technology studies clearly show is constructive work. It requires us to agree our methods have certain shared presuppositions. It requires a great deal of communion or, or shared ground between us before objectification can work. And then um, a simplistic discourse then presumes that objects are facts, are things, are indisputable, they're just there, and everything else is a pure mystery, so the word subject becomes pure mystery. And the world, as we said, could be taken to mean almost anything in any discourse. In fact, in many respects, the world has taken the place of both nature and God in, in discourse. People try to rein in their cosmological ambitions, so they assume that when I speak of the world, you know what I mean. But if I speak of the world, I mean everything, really. And any attempt to refer to everything fails. I mean, mystics have taught us this for a um, long <laughs> Unity, the whole shebang. God or nature, Spinoza. Um, you know. So, subjects. Cognitive science, for me, um, in fact, let, let, let's play a little game. Everyone loves a bit of physics. We just pointed to a beautiful physics experiment, right? Um, now, in fact, physics is a rather esoteric occupation. And we're extremely skilled at it. And we have wonderful instruments, which we agree uh, produce measurements of a particular kind with a great deal of accuracy and reproducibility. And it, it does try to show us something of the non-negotiable conditions of our being. The gravitational constant is just not up for, you know, take all your postmodernism, the gravitational constant is, constant is not going to change. Right. Well, let's pretend that physics was in the business of uh, undergirding our sense of f physical reality, the table I just banged on, things that go bump in the night, the, um, the, the, the reassuring solidity of things. And physics is absolutely not in that game, right? It's not. There's no things in physics. It doesn't describe tables. But we use the word physical to describe this table thumping firm reality. Um, so if physics were in that business of producing, of, of describing teapots, then cognitive science would be in the business of describing subjects, right? And you could rear the pitch here and destroy everything and say, I mean, minds, of course, your mind, my mind, right? No, no one's, no one, just like physics doesn't deliver teapots, cognitive science doesn't deliver minds. There's no minds in cognitive science. It says mind and thought. These are great, a grand abstracta. So the word subject quickly collapses back to your naive view of or, or your absolutely justifiable view of who you are in the universe, how you figure in things. Because if I'm talking to you, Asher, you're a subject. <laughs> you can talk to me as if I'm a bundle of atoms, but I guarantee you I'm taking your subjectivity seriously in conversation because one thing a subject is, subjects can be of different kinds. One thing a subject is, is something into which you can enter a relationship. You and I are in a relationship right now. Don't, don't worry. I'm not going to ghost you. We're going to stay here and have a little conversation. I'm in a much more... I, I, I wouldn't pick out the tree behind you as the thing I'm in a relationship with. I would, I would say it's you I'm in a relationship. And to that extent, this is an intersubjective dialogue. That's fairly simple. There's a distinguished sense of subject, which is something to whom something matters. 
That's not quite the same. In this sense, the subject is uh, the subject is it can be a bearer of uh, functional predicates. So the heart functions in the body. It's for the body because we recognize the economy of the body as a distinguished unity. That means because we've recognized it as a distinguished unity, things matter to it. So you perturb the body and the internal organization and history of the body and its couplings will determine its response. It's not there just to be poked around. Now, in fact, nothing in the universe can be simply poked in that way. But when we encounter the body, we have this strong and justifiable sense of a subject because things matter to a body. Now, person is a different matter. Mind is a different matter. But those are two important different senses of subject. Neither of them solipsistic. In one case, we talked about the body, but we could have talked about any unity to which from which to which we we would be willing to say things matter to it, and the other one is this relational thing. A subject is something into which you enter a dialogue, a dance, and uh, a relationship. So, uh, in my business, I study chanting, as you know, um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. But I have a problem, and put it in the title of my book, which is the notion of collective subjects. You see, I'm grimacing, so all you hearers out there, I don't like that term, collective subjects, but I was stuck with it, because as soon as you say subject, people immediately think person, mind, and cognitive system, and bank balance. Mm. So, yeah, well, you started at the ground floor, you said world and subject, uh, world and subject, yeah, and we said object is easier because we can reach agreement, because we have means of coordinating our doings, reaching epistemological satisfaction for present purposes, and there's a teapot, and we don't have a problem with it. I have no more problem with the teapot than with the subject I'm talking to with you. Where we will be careful is that when there's a teapot on the table, we, we said we can't, no representation of the teapot can capture the teapot in its entirety. The teapot has a history, it goes back to clay mines in China, factories, merchants, got here, presents, and so on. Here's the, the, the teapot got here. And no representation, no drawing of it, photograph of it, CAD diagram of it, or 3D scan of it is going to capture all that, obviously. Now, but for our purposes, it's assuming we're reasonably utilitarian. The teapot is there for us to have a cup of tea with, right? We don't get involved in this, and we don't engage with it further. Now, I have, I have no more difficulty in, in, in knowing or accepting or dealing with your reality than I have with the teapots, except that in the case of the teapot, our joint purposes mean our investigations stop somewhere. We've, we, we, we've uncovered, I mean, sure, you can go into history of teapots, you can do, you know, his teapots of histories. <laughs> you could do a history of teapots. Um, but we're done. Whereas when I'm talking to you, we're never done. The open-endedness is part and parcel of the interaction. Um, I, I will learn from the teapot, but it's finite. What else? I mean, maybe tomorrow I'll learn something new from the teapot. Maybe the teapot's going to change my life precisely because we had this conversation. But usually it's fairly inert, whereas talking to you is a live proposition. I have no idea what you're going to say next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're in the world of embodiment. In activism, do you? I won't say do you stand. Where do you? Where do you hover in that world? Actually, I'm in it. I suppose I think it's a poorly defined world. <laughs> uh, there, as we said, there's no single school of embodied cognitive science, and I'm trying to figure out what it means to speak as an embodied cognitive scientist. But it's my bread and butter. So in that respect, I'm in the world. Uh, but um, so. Maybe I ought to say just a little bit about my personal educational sort of how I got here. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm Irish. I was born in 62. And I became a nurse after school. So I'm a, I'm a German nurse. I became a nurse in Germany. And then I went back to college because I read a fascinating book by Douglas Hofstadter, Gödel Escherbach, which you may have heard of, introduced me to the it introduced me to the perplexities of recursion and the very notion of cognitive science. 
Um, so I went looking for something I could do in that line. And the nearest thing we had was a degree in computer science and linguistics. So I combined those two. I was an undergraduate and then I went off to, to, to look for Douglas Hofstadter. I got into Indiana University where he was and got into the cognitive science program and did a PhD there in a joint major in linguistics and cognitive science. But I was studying speech. By this stage, I'd become a speech person. I was falling into phonetics, a wonderful field. Phonetics is a wonderful field. Uh, I didn't think so going into Indiana. I thought, I'm off to do a PhD in linguistics. The only thing I know is I'm not going to do phonetics. And I got there and did phonetics, and it was the best thing in the world. I also took a class with Doug and got to know him, and it was a wonderful interdisciplinary environment. But what was unique to it, and this is the 1990s, was that everyone in cognitive science, the world of cognitive science at that stage, was buzzing with connectionism. Connectionism was a new deal on the block. The PDP books had come out in 1987, and everyone was playing with the software, and graduate students were outstripping their professors because they got software, and they, you know, professors are like your parents. They can't program a VCR, but very clever. The PDP groups distributed software with their books, and all the clever grad students, me included, picked up this software and started playing with it, and the professors went, oh, shit, the kids are getting unruly again. So it was very, very exciting time, but we in Indiana had a different take on things. We were more revolutionary than everyone else because we had identified a different paradigm change. Everyone likes a good paradigm change, a good revolution. Everyone wants, like 4E is just another one of these hype machines. To some extent. Uh, but we had, um, I would say, confusedly tapped into something that will never go away. We had latched on to the most significant development of mathematics in the second half of the 20th century, the development of nonlinear dynamics, the whole of uh, chaos theory, fractals, nonlinear dynamics, far from equilibrium systems. Dynamical systems was our rallying cry. We didn't know what that meant. We were not good at this. But there was the way academics work is there were lots of productive, sometimes tenuous, sometimes solid connections um, among the disciplines. And that included a lot of people who were on this nonlinear dynamics bandwagon, because a lot of the work was still being done there. It was an incredibly productive time. And people were taking these new ideas and thinking with them. They were thinking with them, and the thoughts were inchoate, and we were not masters of our material, but we knew we couldn't articulate why this was important. Now, in retrospect, there are some facile arguments you can make, and there are some deep arguments you can make. The facile argument is that, you know, there was a reason you were taught calculus in school. It's pretty good for the science shit. It's the natural language of the sciences, which you have anything that varies continuously in time. The way science deals with that is through quantitative modeling using differential equations. Or, indeed, qualitative modeling. Indeed, dynamical models allowed you to capture qualitative and quantitative aspects. It wasn't particularly partisan about those, which is nice. And connections networks, which were so popular, um, they could be looked at as dynamical systems. Once recurrence is involved, they were obviously dynamical systems, and our vocabulary came into use. And so that's, that's where I cut my teeth. Embodiment wasn't much of a rallying cry in the 90s in Indiana. It was connectionism and dynamical systems. Those were the two sort of revolutionary paradigms. Um, I did a PhD in 97. I came back to Ireland after a couple of postdocs in 99. And it's over the next few years, embodiment sort of became the rallying cry um, in various ways. The School of Ecological Psychology and Gibsonian approaches to perception have always trundled along, and we were always very favorably disposed towards them. Jeff Bingham, one of the best ecological psychologists out there, was at Indiana. He taught, taught me, and we had people like Linda Smith and Esther Thielen taking ideas from Gibson and from Scott Kelso's work on task dynamics, coordination dynamics. I don't know if you've ever met that field. Yeah, a little bit. So Scott was the main intellectual force behind my PhD work. Um, that was where I really cut my teeth. And so they were the, the, these ideas were combining. And over the years now, <clears throat> Embodiment has come out as a, a very central, as, as I suppose, the repositioning required in cognitive science to get away from the fantasies of God, God men, people who think they're gods, 
and excluded from the natural order and not animals. Um, it wasn't dynamics, although that's going to be useful. It wasn't connectionist networks. They're going to go, have, they have a different future. <laughs> it was the re attachment to the body. And what I didn't know in the 90s, but I know now, was that the philosophy of biology and its connection to lived experience, to the living body, to, to here, you and me sitting here, had made a breakthrough with the work of Umberto Maturana. You may have heard of, you've heard of him and his notion of auto, autopoiesis, an invented word. Um, and when I say a breakthrough had been made, I don't want to represent science as a constant progress. That's nonsense. If I try to figure out things from where I'm standing right now, there are certain important points. So Descartes pops up in 1600, and yeah, he's important. I'm going to refer to Descartes. Right? I'm not going to refer to everything in Cartesian scholarship thereafter, but he's a landmark. Now, Maturana's work gave rise to uh, fruitful collaborations with Francisco Varela, which gave rise to later the development of the, the School of Inaction, which has been a big concern of mine since. But I don't think we should confuse the working out of the theories and their developments in various ways, because there's various forms, various flavors of this. The reason I'm pointing to Descartes is the same reason, uh, to Maturana is the same reason I'm pointing to Descartes, because that's a landmark. Autopoiesis is the introduction into cosmology of a self of self production of a self producing being, um, and it gives you nothing more than that. Everything else is hard work, and the hard work has been done in the school of inaction and has been done using different approaches to epistemology that are not absolutely rotten with um, Christianity and Christian notions, Protestant notions. The infusion of Buddhist epistemology was very important and destabilizing at that time. Um, the work continues. I think Maturana is the point at which we can finally begin to understand another landmark figure, Charles Darwin. So if we take, uh, we mentioned years are a bit unstable, right? Let's just take about 1850, okay, and move around. Uh, that's around about the time that uh, the theory of natural selection Comes available that evolutionary theory starts being developed really that species are seen to be mutable species is a word that belongs in biology didn't always belong in biology species means as a, as a core meaning which you'll find in the bible which is kind the animals are always of their kind and you recognize your kind it's a very important word that we can come back to but it became refined in the emerging discipline. Remember, biology itself is only emerging as a discipline. And species then becomes attached, unfortunately, to the form of the individual body, which is seen to belong to an essentialized collective. You're a blue whale. Okay, I see you as a blue whale. I can slap your big blue whale back. That's a body. What, what kind of body is it? Well, it belongs to blue whales. Okay, that's an essentialized collective. Where do we find those? Well, if we continue throughout time, if we had continuous access to all of time, we'll never find a border between blue whale and not blue whale, just as we won't between human and not human, right? Um, so that's where evolution takes hold. Now, around the same time, God leaves the, pig, leaves the stage. You know, I mean, we can point to the death of God as announced by Nietzsche and talk that through. But the simple fact is, prior to 1850, if you want to engage in public discourse, you must frame things as if there's a God in the background, indeed, the Christian God. After 1850, you cannot do so. It's You make nonsense of yourself. So there's an absolute watershed there. God dies around there. And Darwin delivers the news that we have to find ourselves in the natural world, that we are not and cannot think of ourselves as a distinguished kind. Now, we don't know what to do with that news. That tells us that we are organisms, and to this day, it's very funny. If you read papers throughout cognitive science, all the various approaches, everyone likes to doff their hat 
at naturalism. Nobody wants to be seen to be making up um, fantasies, Christian fantasies, right? And so they'll talk about the organism, but they don't mean anything by it. So Ray Jackendorf writing about semantic structures refers to the organism because he means the person, but he doesn't want you to understand the person as someone with a soul. He wants to no, we're being naturalistic here, but he's referred to nothing that you can make sense of in terms in organismic senses. And you find that throughout the literature. So when I say I'm, I have difficulty speaking as an embodied cognitive scientist, it's because the discourse, including the whole of the 4E discourse, doesn't know what to do with the terms organism, animal, person, human, and system. They're all different. You and I are persons. Right? We're having a conversation as persons. Now, we might, for example, begin to discuss the term human and what its bounds are and what it, what it means, what it doesn't mean. But that's not going to destroy us as persons, no matter how insane our beliefs are there. You know, we're, the person is, is, is my minimal basis for having a conversation. Right? The human is a real problem. We'll come back to that. But it's linked to the other two, organism and animal. From Maturana's work, organism means only self-production. Everything else we have to add on. Every, the observer becomes implied. Madarana gives you this little gift as an embodied cognitive scientist. You can acknowledge the existence of other beings who have their own purposes. Um, everything else is, I mean, any other observation is going to be observer dependent. We're going to always. Second order cybernetics is very important that you're the one drawing the distinctions. Um, and people do. People try to build from Maturana's minimal insight. Ezekiel Di Paolo is particularly important here, adding things like adaptivity and so on to the basic insight. But that's that's exegesis and, and, and you know downstream of the insight of autopoiesis. So here we are. In the incidentally, in the Gibsonian literature. You can sensitize your ear to this. If you read those papers, they, they call themselves psychology, they're not psychology. And they're, um, but they, they also, they don't speak of the organism. They speak of the animal. And it's a real, once you become sensitive to this, it's a real clangor. Because the animal, you, no, well, they're not obviously making an animal-human distinction because they're calling themselves psychology. They're saying, we're about you, you know, and you're an animal. But they've missed out on something because animals, well, we're talking here about how words are used. I'm not going to I'm not going to define anything. The term animal appears in many contexts and gives rise to many visions. One of well, one important distinction is you can fuck a person, but not an animal. You can kill an animal, but not a person. And with that, we set up industrial scale flesh processing machine. If we knew what went on in intensive farming today, we wouldn't never sleep a wink. The only reason we can sleep is because they're animals. So that word is doing an enormous favor to us and shutting us off from the material conditions of our own living. So it's really weird to be addressed as an animal because that animal has traditionally been used to distinguish, make a distinction between the, the beast and the Christian. <laughs> so organism is not much better. And here's where we have to do work. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely right about Gibson. Like, no part of Gibson reads like psychology or science. It just... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's behaviorist. Everything is structured by the task. And it, I mean, it's, it's very good. Don't get me wrong. It's good at what it does. It's very good at what it does. One thing ecological psychology is particularly good at is reining in the um, over-exuberant use of the term information. Information is given, is given a particular meaning in ecological psychology, but it give, it's given meaning in the context of a task. And without the task, it doesn't mean anything, which means that the animal has to already have a set goal, a set purpose. Um, I don't want to critique ecological psychology so much as recognize its very severe limitations, but it's it's interestingly different from the construction of the person within cognitivist approaches. Absolutely. I mean, it, it has all these misnomers, but that I think that's because it's dealing in a very fresh, novel way with a very difficult problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and the whole marriage of dynamical systems theory, nonlinear dynamical systems modeling to ecological psychology um, is so tricky. It's so tricky. They just they feel like water and oil. That's an interesting point. Yes, there is a certain uh, sense in which in, e in ecological psychology, the external world, a very bizarre phrase, um, is, 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 is pre-given. It exists. And the animal is already also fully formed. And all we're talking about is then the sort of reverberations of the animal in, the, in that given environment, whereas the world is much more lively than that. And animals are much less definable, defined, and, and organized by task than that. So, yeah, moving from there, though, to a livelier picture presents us with interpretive challenges. One good approach there that marries somewhat with it is the sensory motor correspondence theory of Noe and O'Regan. So in 2001, Kevin O'Regan and Alvin Noe had a very important paper in Brain and Behavioral Sciences, introducing what they call the sensory motor correspondence theory of vision. Now, they were dealing with vision, which is a strange thing to deal with. There's lots of perplexities when you come to, to vision. But the, and it was a very long and detailed and, and meandering and scattershot article. Um, but it was a useful way of thinking through what was going on with uh, sensory substitution devices. Do you, have you ever met sensory substitution devices? So if you take a panel of needles, which you place on your belly, and you attach them to a, C, a camera couple device and a camera on your forehead, and you move your head and you arrange that the changing pattern of light on the camera produces a changing pattern of movement on, the, uh, on your skin surface. Then as you move your head, you'll tickle yourself. And that's what's going to happen. You're going to move your head and it's going to tickle. But over time, because of the lawfulness that inheres in the pattern of sensation and your attendant movements, I'm not sequencing them in time, the lawfulness that inheres in that relation means that over time, you acquire a mastery, a skill of this. That's why it's called a sensory motor correspondence theory. And the phenomenology changes. People begin to treat it as if it was more like sight than like being tickled. And you can get to the stage where you could, for example, catch a ball that's thrown at you. You know, the camera, you, you're blindfolded. You've got your camera and you're being tickled. And uh, boom, you catch a ball. Um, so that's understanding how we can train novel senses. You know, uh, people have played games with novel senses, something that keeps you oriented towards north all the time by a little magnetic sensor in your belt, for example. So those kinds of approaches, very low-level approaches, um, they have the potential to enrich the Gibsonian ones because th those are clearly not of the um, imagistic kind, the cognitive they have nothing to do with the cognitivist approach. If they're going to fit in anywhere, it's going to be with the relation with relational approaches. It is all about relationality, but they're coming from a slightly different place than Gibsonians. As I said, Gibsonianism is behaviorist. It starts with pilots landing planes in poor visual conditions. It's a very good task. There's nothing wrong with pursuing that, and I hope someone does a good job because we want planes to land safely. As a basis for understanding the miracle of living, it's it's a bit odd. Um, so I, I, there's room for those to grow, um, but frankly, ecological psychology has to get a, a little bit less cult-like. It's been a very cliquey, closed domain. You're, you're, like you were either inside it or outside it. It's ne it was never the case of yeah, well, we can use a bit of that. <laughs> um, let me ask you. Let me ask you a controversial question. Where, uh, what do you what do you think about representation? Um, do we still need representations? Absolutely. We need representations to make shopping lists. We need representations to take notes in class. Uh, we're stuck with a political system in which we'll call our, our elected representatives representatives and they'll, in some weird sense, voice our concerns. Sorry, so uh, of course we need representations. We need, we need them for shopping lists at least. Where's your question going other than that? Uh, mental representations. Ah! Of course we need representations. It's the mental bit is the problem, because I, if I were to engage in an argument as to whether we need them or not, we'd be discussing the nature of an imaginary thing called mind. Um, I am of, I think in ways, 
that are never satisfied with representational accounts. As compelling as necessary as representational accounts of in any domain are, there's always more to the world. And, and by the world here, make it the mind if you want. <laughs> uh, the idea of a representation is to uh, freeze something which cannot be frozen, to capture it. I mean, the snapshot, is that a representation? I mean, rather than mental representation, because we talk about a photograph or something, you know, something tangible. A snapshot is not the same thing as the place, obviously. Uh, a representation is never the same thing as that which it's about. Now, fans of internal construction of minds and cognitive systems tend to believe that we have, I can't make sense of it, inner representations of an external world. Look, there's no external world. <laughs> there just is. <laughs> the term external world was invented by Johannes Fichte in the 19th century. Prior to that, nobody would ever dream of talking about an external world. What nonsense. <laughs> But, but we've got a fictitious interior. Deleuze and Guattari call this the black hole of subjectivity. Everyone speaks of looking inside yourself. There's nowhere inside to look. It's full of blood and guts. Look inside yourself. You know, introspect. What the hell am I to do with that? So the idea of an external world that needs to be represented conjures up the black hole of subjectivity into which it has to be projected. Yeah, I, I think I tend to think like, like a bit like what Anthony Shimero might have in mind. Um, I don't know if I can appropriately summarize his views, but like the idea that you might have higher order representations. It's not that they're implausible. They can totally exist, but you don't need them to explain the elementary stuff. No, I'm not going to interpret Tony's work. I know Tony well, but we, we, were, we were in grad school together. And we're, we're still in contact. Um, I'm not going to interpret Tony's work, but Tony is more willing to engage in the cut and thrust and to bring dynamical insights and dynamical thinking to the table in uh, the cut and thrust of journal discourse and experiments and so on. I, I, I love his work. I always find it very motivating and, and exciting. Um, but because of his willingness to engage in that kind of discourse, he will take positions with respect to representation, which I will neither take nor not take because they might be necessary in that conversation in order to reach this degree of understanding with someone. Like, we can speak of as-if representations, um, and we can speak of as-if mirror neurons, if you like. You know, mirror neurons exist if you ex begin with this outlandish premise. Um, so uh, I find uh, Tony's work totally congenial. I'm just, I, I, I fear, I, I know. Um, we're, we're, we're like this. Everyone tries to be more radical than the next guy, right? Dan Huda was also radical in action, and Tony is a radical embodied cognitive scientist. The thing is, we need to get vastly more radical. Vastly more radical. And we're making little moves in embodied cognitive science, but it's not our job. I'm sorry. This thing called the human is about to die out because, you know, the, the planet, the species, all those kinds of things. The scientific future. Uh, we need we need to support different ways of thinking about ourselves and our position and things, and that's a radical task. And it's not going to be done by proving that fingers wag in a particular way. Although those experiments might help, might contribute. Yeah. What do you what do you make of the work on identity, um, on identity, selfhood? trying to nail down these descriptions. From where I'm coming from, I mean, it depends who's asserting what identity in what context. I mean, if, 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 you could walk around my neighborhood here and you can find people who belong to the Boy Scout troop and who don't belong to the Boy Scout troop. And we can draw that distinction. And in that sense, it's an identity. But the language of identity and essences and being has is the main current and representation is the main current in Western philosophy. But it's always had an attendant second current, that of process and change. There's Spinoza, Bergson, Whitehead, Deleuze, dynamics, embodiment. That's this is a different path. There's a long history of damage done 
by assuming identity and essence. And we continue to do it to ourselves today. We hit ourselves over the head with a hammer looking for the true self and trying to assert an identity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Shifting gears a bit. Um, so joint speech. How, how did you come to work on this? That's a good question. And it, 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 there's a little bit of a story to it. Um, I hope you don't mind. Uh, wh when I went to do my PhD, everyone was into dynamics. And I ended up working with a phonetician. So speech rhythm was the thing I became occupied with. And I had people, because if you think dynamically, you and, and you're not very good at it, like we weren't, then you're using simple mass spring equations. Right? And uh, if you're using simple mass spring equations, then an obvious thing to do is to get people to repeat something along with a metronome. As you can look at the coupling in time, you've got measurements in time, you can be all sciencey about it, and you can do plots and the experimental conditions, wonderful experimental theater. And so I had people speaking along with metronomes. Um, and then I, just after the end of my PhD, I had a sort of a bombshell one day. I was taking a nap at lunch in Northwestern University, and I just did a drawing of two heads linked together. And I went to sleep. And for the next two years or so, I was busy. But when I arrived back in Dublin, I pulled out that drawing and went, hang on, what was that was important. What was I supposed to do with that? And I realized people don't like speaking with bloody metronomes. People love speaking with people. So I started getting people in and having just watching, doing the same kind of game, asking people to speak together but without a clock. And boy, were they good. I, astonishingly, like the, the voice is incredibly plastic. In the course of a day, you might speak to your aged mother. You might holler at the kids in your lawn. You might plead with your social worker over the phone. You might shout at your husband. You might, you know, your voice is incredibly plastic and fits the circumstances. But give two people a laboratory. Tell them speak together in time, three, two, one, go, they lock on like a machine. It's machine-like. In fact, Deleuze's idea of the machine is very apt here. It is machine-like how they synchronize their speech. Now, phoneticians live in a world of variability. They are always looking for invariance, usually because they've been praying to the false gods of Chomsky and linguistics. They've been looking trying to do cleanup on the messy physical reality in order to deliver pristine symbols to the phonologists. Here's a phoneme, sir. Here's a tone. Very difficult things to find in the messiness of the real world. But um, if invariance, when it occurs, is astonishing to a phonetician. And when you get two people together and they lock together in this machine-like fashion, with no practice. They don't even get better with practice. They can do it. We just have this ability. I was flummoxed. And so I studied this for a few years, and I called it synchronous speech. And I think I have to be careful with my terms. Put two people in a lab, ask them to do this machine-like task of reading an unmotivated sentence, and that's synchronous speech. And it's very interesting. So then a young professional, I started applying for grants. Hmm. Went through round after round of grant application. Lots of my colleagues were interested in what I had to say. And we kept not getting funding. There were often collaborative grants. Uh, but the thing about grant writing, and this is maybe a useful lesson for, for young academics, is it can be incredibly rewarding not to get funded. Every time you approach money, you have to tell a story, which means you have to not only convince the funders, you have to sort of convince yourself a little bit first. And so the story got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I went from studying to unmo two speakers reading unmotivated sentences in a machine-like fashion in the laboratory to realizing that I had stumbled in to an Aladdin's cave of human forms of assembly and communion, chanting. I then had to discipline it. I, over the years, I've developed the term joint speech because I think it's an extremely important if you ever want to understand what kind of being we are, this is a, I'll use the term, languaging behavior. I'm not using language in the Chomsky sense. But this is found in every society, as far back as we can peer, long before history appears, long before writing appears. We, the oldest written 
um, evidence we have is already testament for a vibrant existence of a of liturgical structure with chanted elements. I'm speaking of the Temple Hymn of Kesh of 2600 BC. Wonderful piece. And it has clear verse chorus structure. You can see where people are supposed to join in. People chant and, well, I, I, since then, I've just been running around thinking about chanting or joint speech. Because if you are modest in your knowledge about minds, bodies, and the whole philosophical stuff, Sometimes it's useful to have an uncontroversial empirical starting point. Remember we said, if we put the teapot on the table, there's more to this teapot than you and I can ever fathom or intuit or something. But for utilitarian purposes, if we're getting on with our lives and we want to have a tea ceremony, for example, Grant, we have a tea, we've got an empirical starting point. Joint speech does this. And I have defined it as multiple people uttering the same sounds at the same time. That definition has been polished a bit over the years. So I said uttering, I didn't say speaking or singing. I said sounds, I didn't say words or texts. Um, but one thing about that definition is it allows you to find it. You can go out there and within, you can find this all over the place. So it is, in a way, a sampling device. That is, we can take our observations wherever this occurs. And like moving beyond the teapot to the tea ceremony, don't worry about the words they're speaking. Well, we can go back to the words they're speaking. They're, they're kind of interesting. But what the hell's going on? What's going on there? We're not in a laboratory. We're in somewhere where human stuff is going on. And what happens is quite remarkable. Um, I'm, only, I'm only beginning to understand this myself. So if you look at the history of the emergence of psychology and sociology at the end of the 19th century, Psychology becomes a weird thing, which was, yeah, I'm, we don't even have to go into that. Let's just leave psychology there. Um, sociology arose because people had discovered society. Nobody ever noticed society before. Now, society isn't a thing, but when you notice it, suddenly it's a thing. And because of the naturalistic register and the power of the sciences in the late 19th century, they were freaked out by ants. You know how much work the Victorians did on ants? Man, they're all over the place. Aldous Huxley's brother, Julian, was working on ants. Trophallaxis. Ants have loads to tell us. But in, in, when you look at an ant colony, you've got this clear, stark divide between the individual and the collective. Furthermore, the individual seems to be sacrificed to the collective. Right? Yeah, fix social roles, no bettering yourself. You're a worker, you're a drone, you're a queen. And you sacrifice yourself for the good. Of, so in a sense, the colony is the unit you're concerned with, the subject. The ant is an organ of the larger colony. And this freaked them the hell out because this is the time of the Industrial Revolution. You've got the beginning of the, you've got your disciplinary societies. You've got your, everyone's going to the, to the factories. Everyone's moving into urban locations, going to, to fix workplaces. And uh, urban living is becoming a thing. Uh, so it scared the bejesus out of them. Sociology came along and tried to get a handle on things, and it still does. And sociologists for 150 years now have tried to get other people to believe that social things are really real. They're not epiphenomena that arise only as the result of interaction of preformed individuals, but they are real. If you have a solipsistic psychology, the social is now epiphenomenal. If we encounter a theater in which someone has shouted the word fire and everyone's in a panic, then there's no um, fluid dynamics going on. There's just a bunch of individuals. Whereas you'll understand what's going on much better in terms of fluid dynamics, to be honest with you. If people are running through narrow exits. You don't want to ask them about how connected they feel to the universe and what their working memory is doing. That's the wrong, the wrong way to view what's going on. The flow through the door is the real thing here. Psychologists are not, not needed. So sociologists have had this problem. Others have similar definitional problems of getting people to take the things they study really uh, seriously and to draw lines, because we're, we're, we always draw lines around things. Ritual studies. 
There's another one. And the word religion has messed up everything. I'm sorry. The the word the, the manner in which we talk about religion has messed up everything so that um arguing over the bounds of ritual, for example, becomes a rite of passage if you're in cultural studies. Um and it's a bit pointless. Now, if instead, as an embodied cognitive scientist, I say, I don't know anything about culture or society or persons. I'm going out there. I'm looking for joint speech because I've got an empirical definition. Where do I land? And having done this for 20 years, I'll tell you where you land. There are four big domains that pop out that are not otherwise linked. They are ritual, sports, protest, and primary education. There are interesting differences between these, and joint speech occurs in very many other occasions. It's not limited by these. But these domains articulate themselves when you start studying joint speech, which allows you to ask about commonalities as well as specificities. You know, if you're in cultural studies, you like to draw out the specific. But I'm a more of a lumper than a splitter. I want to see what's going on here common in common between them. The fact that we got here with a description of a behavior that we really don't understand, but that is foundational for human social living, is kind of important. Every society has its rituals. They don't all have the sports, that's true. Most of them have some kind of primary education. And protest is fairly widespread. Um, what an interesting set to consider together. So, because of the way that we've messed up the discourse. I'm now beginning to speak of these as domains of human assembly and communion. I don't even like the word human in there. I said we're persons. I'm not granting any existence to a superordinate category with a clear boundary. Um, but this is people peopling, as Alan Watts would say. Yeah? This is people peopling. And every time you see people peopling in this fashion, I at least just go, wow. How could we not have seen this before? <laughs> What's being brought into existence is transitory. It needs to be enacted. It needs to be... This is why you know, we can start looking at some of the structural characteristics of joint speech. Often, there's a huge amount of repetition. Speakers and listeners are not distinguished. The way we normally think about language and mind is not, it's not relevant here. Things have to be said, and they have to be said again and again and again. There's no information transfer, message passing. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for the Virgin Mary, but the Hail Mary, I got a first time, guys. <laughs> you know, there's no news value in it. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking is about are activities that must be done in a certain sense. So let's look at the must be done. Rituals. Many rituals have to be carried out in order to keep the cosmos going. I don't know, you know, if you dive into other cultures, other traditions, whether you find yourself in Islam, in Judaism, in Buddhism, in Taoism, wherever you find yourself, you will find rituals that are important to ensure the stability of the cosmos. And participation is often mandatory. Protest has its own urgency. We're not protesting because we want to, we're protesting because we have to. Primary education, there's an, there's an interesting asymmetry here because it's the values of the elders which are being stamped on the juniors. It's not the children who, who decide this. But, and and here's, here, here's the, the advantage of having this frame now. This makes it immediately comparable when we look at uh, little British school kids reciting their times tables. Three times three is nine. Three times four is 12. They do this all over the world. And you go to a madrasa in Pakistan or Kenya or somewhere, and now you find kids chanting the Quran. Mathematics is not Islamic studies. But in each case, the sacred values of the authorities are being stamped on the children, and it's very important that the children do this chanting. In fact, when you get into Quranic studies in many parts of the world, kids, there's a virtue to speaking the words of the Quran. It's a it's it's speech. It's not a text, and kids are encouraged to speak it. And there's a great virtue to knowing the whole Quran off by heart. No importance placed on understanding. You don't have to speak Arabic. You just have to make the sounds. 
So that obligatory character is real. You could say the same of kids learning maths. You know, you don't have to understand it. You just have to be able to do the equation. <laughs> Embarrassingly similar. Um, so that's the power of joint speech. It allows me to see these processes and wonder why they've been missed. The fact is that, of course, the study of any one of these belongs to a different domain. You know, you're in cultural studies, you're in rituals. Oh, God, there's religion. Oh, no, no, we're over here in political science. We're doing protests. Yeah. But if I form a term in forms of assembly and communion, that allows us to make these comparisons, see things like the asymmetry in the educational sense, place it beside the protest sense, place it beside the ritual sense. and. Sports is, a, is, is, is very important in the contemporary sense, but it, it has also some interesting features. You don't get chanting in all sports. You get chanting precisely in those sports in which you get transgenerational support. Team sports with transgenerational support. My da supported Leeds United, so I support Leeds United. And you can swap the players in and out, and it doesn't matter. You know, When Boris Becker leaves the tennis stage, he's not replaced by someone else. There's a new player there. But your footballers can be swapped in and out. Now, different sporting traditions develop different kinds of chanting traditions, of course. But to come back, you asked me a simplistic question about identity earlier. What did I think about identity? And I said, who's, where, what's been asserted? And I pointed to the Boy Scouts just because I wanted to avoid the question. But now we're going to come back to identity because what is happening when you go to the football stadium, like a pilgrimage, you go to the football stadium every week or you go once every four years to the World Cup, and you join in this heaving mass of other bodies and you commune in support and in reenactment of your identity as a supporter of your team. This is a non-essentialist and enacted view of identity. This is so tough conceptually because, I mean, all the different fields that try to deal with these things, sociology, political science, cultural studies, just have such different views as to even the autonomy that they attach to the the subject of study here, right? Like some may look at it in a epiphenomenal or a reductive way. And some see it as emergent mm-hmm. phenomena to be explained. And then, I mean, not to mention that just conceptually the, the language of discourse is all over the place. The language of discourse is all over the place. And that's why I said at the start of our conversation here that I'm going to try and speak as an embodied cognitive scientist. I'm go- I try not to get lost in jargon, to be honest with you. And I start with an empirical starting point. And what I may refer to these word merchants here and there, I have found that because I'm sensitized by my education and concerns, that I have available to me a means of looking at people peopling, which is enormously rich and is not currently exploited. And it doesn't get, yes, introducing this now back into the discourse, that leads to difficulties. On the other hand, a lot of the discourse is so polluted you wouldn't want to. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just a better idea to start fresh. Or say what you have to say, say it well, say it in an appropriate time and place and just be done with it. Don't rack up meaningless publication. I I feel like there's just, there's a multi-layered problem. here. Like I think sometimes you treat something as reductive to another science or another domain of explanation, but I don't think reduction like that is ever that clean, that you can just explain social, all social phenomena is reduced to the epiphenomenal expressions of some predisposed psychological agent. Oh, God, no. Now, I I have to say, I hope this isn't too shocking, I'm not a big fan of explanation. I think explanation is a form of violence. Explanation kills something. Once you've explained it, that's it. I mean, okay, if I I have to assemble an IKEA flat pack bed, I want someone to explain to me how to do it. Because then we're done. If I'm looking at people peopling, I don't want explanation. I want more. I want more puzzlement. I want more problems, more questions. Because I'm seeing so much. I don't want to kill it with explanation. What about understanding? Does understa- is understanding more friendly to you? Yeah, understanding is a, is a slightly more noble goal than explanation. Explanation is shut up. I told you. Did you not understand? Understanding is, oh, okay, I, I, I feel I have a grasp on it myself which means maybe I could um, produce similar justifying statements in in an appropriate context that that would come from me, not by referring to the authority in the textbook. Understanding is good. 
It's not the end, though. Right, right. A- anything that limits to one modality, like building a model of something mm. amounts to understanding, is is always going to be limiting. So you 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 raised you mentioned in passing an interesting word earlier on when we were discussing IQ tests. Um, you mentioned the word wisdom. That's a peculiar word, isn't it? Um, we'd, we'd like science to be a form of wisdom, but it sure as hell is not a form of wisdom. We speak of wisdom traditions, but we speak of them with a certain nostalgia and, and um, fondness and, of course, necessary bias. Um, I, it's true. I am in, I, let me pull back a little bit and just take a position with respect to scientific discourse. As an embodied cognitive scientist, I am informed not just by science, and certainly not just by science of the last 10 years. I am informed by the history of Western thought, and increasingly by the activity, dialectical activity between Indian schools. Buddhists, uh, we don't even have good words for these, right? Right, right. We, We gloss things over with this stupid British Empire word of religion and Hindu and so on. But the debates that have gone on between Advaita Vedanta, Kashmiri Shaivists, and Buddhists of various stripes are absolutely wonderful, have been held respectfully, rely on a common commitment to what I think are our goals as well, which is finding a way of living appropriate to an embodied being, and possibly even an ecstatic and joyous way of living. Um, and it's traded by various words in the marketplace. So in, in the Christian marketplace, we trade heaven after life. There you go. You know, just shut up. You get it. You get it in the next life. And in Buddhist terms, we 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 we, we promise them some nonsense called enlightenment or you know moksha, uh, liberation. Um, but that's just soteriology. Um, and psychology is is the miserable soteriology of of the scientific discourse, right? Um. I found it very interesting when I was, I used to drive into work and I'd have the radio on a long time ago. And anytime they'd interview, they'd occasionally interview scientists. And you could always tell when there was a psychologist was being interviewed because the tone of voice changes. Suddenly they're speaking in a breathy voice because, you know, they're there to calm you. They're worried about you. They're interested in what's good for you. You know, chemists, when they're talking about rust, don't have to change the tone of their voice. What kind of science is this that needs to change the tone of its way? So science has a problem. You know, it delivers vaccines. Yeah, well, interesting. Lots to think about with vaccines. Um, atomic bombs, um, killing machines, drones, um, surveillance society, uh, support for authoritarian regimes. Science delivers us all kinds of things, but it sure as fuck is not a re- re- wisdom tradition. It's missing some pieces for that. You've got to look for that elsewhere. Now, in cognitive science, We're not in the same business as physics, though we must meet someday. We are concerned with one of these beautiful generative triads that have informed most philosophical and theological schools. The relationship between the knower, the known, and the means of knowing. When I lay it out like that, then you can understand contemporary cognitive science as being a modern engagement with that particular triad in the language developed in the social historical circumstances after the second world war with the talk of computers and informations and all that kind of junk but you can see that inquiry into that triad is much older and has been made explicit in this form you find it in maimonides you find it in proclus you find it in india all over the place and they're really good at this there's been really good moves made but they can't be articulated in every circumstance so what what is contemporary cognitive science is done in a contemporary register in a contemporary vocabulary for sale to the contemporary journals the enterprise is older and um, can be articulated in many different ways. And that's why I say embodied cognitive science needs to disengage itself from cognitive fantasies because we have a task ahead of us, but it's an old task. Yeah, Exploring this is an old task. That's why, as I said, I'm not a big fan of explanation. I want to inquire. Yeah, no, I mean, 
I really like your idea of explanation as, as violence. Like, I think with the contemplative traditions, nothing more can be true. Uh, the, the, there's no point to just giving an explanatory expression of the contemplative traditions that's missing the whole point. Absolutely. And the contemplative traditions have riches to offer us. There is so much we can learn. There are skills. They're not all it, well disciplined, well ordered, and professionalized and available through universities. When you read of the insights of contemplatives, yeah, yeah, let's not give up on that. And that, that incidentally is not to privilege yogis in caves over scientists. You know, uh, um, contemplation uh, is, is not foreign to Europeans either. We have a long history of it. I draw from Christian mystics as much as from Indians. Nicholas of Cusa is one of my absolute favorites. Meister Eckhart. These are wonderful, wonderful writers. And their works can be put alongside the very, very best insights of people coming from the Advaita and Shankaracharya or Nagarjuna or Kashmiri Shaivism, Avanavagupta. Those are the luminaries of those kinds of schools. They can be usefully combined because, you know, we're ignoramuses. I'm sorry, I was only born a couple of years ago. I'm only going to be around for a couple of years. I read a few books. What the hell do I know? What could I possibly know? Luckily, I've had an education and can see that, wow, some people have got somewhere over the years. What do you what do you make like at least of the at least of the in principle attempt to make science in the contemplative traditions friendly, um, if not compatible or expressed in similar languages of discourse, at least be able to work together. Recognize they're not in the same business. They're not in the same business. Science is basically a way of engaging in a situation. That can garner consensus. We agree instruments. We agree on what a measurement is and what is being measured and what use is to be made of those. So it's a very, science is a very practical business. It's not what it's often mistaken for, the fundamental insight into the nature of reality. For that, contemplative traditions are required. And guess what? You're finite. <laughs> You have a body and you're a bit stupid. That's as far as you're going to get. Um, but if you can find your place in the universe in a body, that's kind of where the contemplative tradition, that's what, that's what heaven is that the contemplatives offer you, right? Uh, yes, we can facilitate this. We can, we can um, promote mutual forms of engagement. But we shouldn't mistake, you see, science is treated as a Delphic oracle. Scientists say, you know, I hate that phrase. Boffins. You might as well call those boffins. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you the hard question straight on then. Um, <laughs> um, what what does wisdom mean to you? Then? Yeah, well, I wouldn't... Um, I, I, yeah, no, I, I don't have a view of that except that I've learned that some people are more trustworthy than others when I engage with some people, with some subjects. Um, they seem to some people I'm not bothered reading. Some people I am bothered reading. Some people I can learn from. Um, if I'm learning stuff that's worthwhile, I think I am, then those people I'm learning from have something, an orientation towards people, things, living that I can learn from. That's not to seal it, shrink wrap it into a tradition. It's to realize that this is going on all the time. I think we're much better than we actually think we are. We can talk about the problems of scientific discourse when the cows come home, but that doesn't remove our fundamental brilliance. I think we are fundamentally gorgeous, wonderful creatures, but we're very bad at expressing that. 